Testing. Okay. Can, does it hear me? Testing. Okay. Bonsoir. Vous pouvez me, can you hear me? Yes. All the way at the back of the room. Oh, yes, I can hear it. I can hear. It. Okay. Well, hello. <laughs> Bonsoir et bienvenue à l'Alliance Française de Chicago. Good evening and welcome to the Alliance Française of Chicago. I am Mary Ellen Canellan, the Executive Director, and I am thrilled to have so many of you with us tonight, not only in the auditorium, but also online via Facebook Live. Tonight, we welcome all foodies, all bon vivant, all, all gourmet and gourmand, to learn a little bit about the uh, mysteries that surround the invention of French restaurants and wine pairing. And after we get through that, you will have a chance to test your pairing skills in our salon with a, a glass of Chinon, a glass of Macon, a little bit of Brie, and the Riette de Canard. So, Who's going to take us on this exploration? Well, we're terribly fortunate to have Rebecca Sprang, who is the professor of history and the director of the Center for 18th Century Studies at Indiana University, and our very own Epicurean attorney, Richard Shepro. Before we do this, though, I want to make a couple of announcements um, for, again, that will be of interest to this crowd. The first is that we have our next cooking class with our chef in residence, Madeline Bullwinkle, on Saturday, February 29th, and the subject will be potato power, which I think sets you up perfectly for St. Patrick's Day that will be coming in March. And also, à ne pas manquer is a chance to taste authentic cuisine from around the globe connected to the French culture. We are going to have our Festival de la Francophonie that the kickoff night will be February 28th, and you will receive a passport and be able to go to seven different kitchens and taste the kind of cuisine that is inspiring so many chefs, chefs around the globe today. Uh, we are going to have winter favorites like uh, the Swiss raclette, and also from our hearty Canadian friends in the courtyard, they're going to be serving maple sugar taffy on pieces of snow. <laughs> so if you're the hearty type, please come for that. All right. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our guests. First, respect, Rebecca Sprang is the author of Spang, excuse me, Spang is the author of The Invention of the Restaurant, Paris and the Modern Gastronomic Culture. It was reprinted by Harvard Press in a special 20th anniversary edition with a new preface by Rebecca and um, by a f with a foreword none other than um, by a Adam Gopnik of The New Yorker. The original book won two major prizes and was translated into Japanese, Portuguese, Turkish, and modern Greek. In addition to her position as a professor of history and director of the Center for 18th Century Studies, she also directs LAMP, which is liberal arts and management program, a nationally recognized program that combines the benefits of a liberal arts education with core wor workplace competencies through the Kelly School of Business. Her book is available, available in the Salon, and she'd be delighted to sign it for you. And then our very own polymath, Renaissance man, Rick Shepro will be with us. He is an attorney with an international practice, a law professor who has a very special relationship with food and wine. In addition to writing about regulations governing awful foie gras, seafood, and, and other such um, foods, Shepro is an accomplished cook and an officer of onophile organizations such as La Confrérie des Chevaliers de Tasse de Vin and the La Commanderie de Bordeaux. Through his work in France, he had the opportunity to meet Joel Robuchon. And out of that, um, Monsieur Robuchon advised him on the renovation of his kitchen, so we should all be so lucky. <laughs> 
uh, he presented his paper, Le Mariage entre May and Va Les May et Vin, um, the marriage between food and wine, on the geographical and historical origins of pairing a food with a particular wine in France at the Oxford University Symposium on Food and Cookery in 2017, and it was published in 2018. This, too, will be available in the Salon. We have it in printed copy, but it is available on our website through a PDF. So without further ado, I hope we will give a very warm welcome to Rebecca Spang and Rick Shepro. Thank you very much. Um, and you can hear me in the back fine? Good. OK. So it's really fun to be talking about this. Um, uh, as uh, was noted, it's uh, an old book and a new book. Um, and it's a really fun thing to talk about. I never get bored of it. And it's one of those great topics so rare among academic studies that you can be interested in it even if you don't care about history and you normally get bored at academic lectures. Uh, so uh, people sometimes say to me, you know, restaurants, nobody had to invent them. Surely, you know, it's just a pretty obvious thing. But I think if we think about it for just a little while, if you think about the word, you realize that there is a specific history here, and it's a history that begins in France. Um, so the word, of course, comes from the verb Restore or so restore. I don't have to tell this audience that sometimes it's reflexive and sometimes it's not. Um, meaning to restore or to refresh. So we need to think about what's going to be restored and refreshed. Um, but we can pause for a moment to realize that the word for restaurant in all of these European languages is pretty much the French word. So I think that suggests that all of these places, all of these languages, got the basic idea and structure of restaurants as we know them today from the French example. Right? If, if, if they didn't use this word, um, we might think that there was an older history there before. Um, and of course, there is a very different history in Asia that I'm not going to touch on, um, but maybe will come up in the question. So, what just was it um, that, what, what is this restoration coming from? There's an old history, um, one that one actually still sees uh, written up. Um, I just saw it uh, in an article about fresh, French restaurants in the past year, um, that traces the origin of restaurants to the French Revolution. And, um, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Let's do this. Um, so. I mean, people ate out before there were restaurants. Right? That's obvious. Um, so uh, there were taverns. There were street vendors. Um, remember that for most of human history, most people who lived in cities were too poor to have a kitchen. Right? A kitchen was a luxury. So for most of human history, people who live in urban areas are going to be eating from street stalls, they're going to be eating prepared food. They're not making their own food. Um, and so it's not that people made all their own meals before there were restaurants, but there were not things called restaurants. And conversely, before there were restaurants, wealthy people who had kitchens and starting in the 18th century, even designated rooms specifically used only for dining. So you've got here. Um, a seating plan for a dinner at court, um, or designs for 18th, very lavish 18th century dining rooms. Um, these people don't need to go out to eat. They have a house full of servants. Right? It's not as if they think, I don't want to cook, we'll go out. Um, that's not the issue for them, right? <laughs> you know, if, you're <laughs> if you're Louis says you don't think, I don't want to cook, or the Duchesse de je ne sais pourquoi. Um, so, it's not going to be that the people who were so wealthy didn't feel like cooking, or that the people who were so poor were cooking all the time and wished they could go out because they were going out all the time. 
it was actually a sign of status not to have to go out. So that really leaves us with a question of how did there start to be these things called restaurants? How did they become an enjoyable leisure activity? And crucially, how did they become associated with Paris? Because if you look at this woodcut um, from the mid 19th century, you see that by this point, a meal in the restaurant, and uh, it dis distinguished between the fairly cheap Duval and the higher end Vefour. In both places, of course, you've got the country yokels who don't know how to eat and so have put the entire roast in their mouth. Uh, <laughs> the same way that the country yokels don't know what to make of the, ca of the camel. All right? But so how did this become a distinctive part of French culture by being a distinctive part of Paris culture? That's really what my book sets out to answer. So once upon a time, the answer to that question traced, tra traced restaurants to the French Revolution. And the way that story goes is that the revolution happened, aristocratic privilege is destroyed, all the aristocrats flee abroad, they leave their servants behind, the servants are out of work, the servants open restaurants. So, and that kind of, I mean, it makes an intuitive sense. Right? So first, you demolish the Bastille prison, and then a year later, they had a festival on the site where the Bastille had stood, and shortly at that festival, there were people selling wine and food. And so then when the festival is over, why not set up a restaurant? It makes intuitive sense. It happens also to be wrong. <laughs> because there's an 18th century history of French restaurants, a history that precedes the revolution by several decades. Um, and that we see peeking out here um, I, rem I still remember how excited I was when I found this source. You know, today, maybe you could Google it up on Google Books, but back in the day, I was sitting in my seat in the old Bibliothèque Nationale, and I was literally jumping up and down in my seat. I mean, like, like I was so excited. Because notice that this is from 1767, so 25 years before supposedly there are any restaurants. And it says that this restaurant is going to serve at a modest price, only those dishes that contribute to the conservation or restoration, that's why we use that word, of good health. So the key takeaway here is that the first restaurants are in many ways also the first health food restaurants. And then that it goes on to specify that though this is for people who suffer from weak and delicate chests and whose diets therefore do not include an evening meal. So a restaurant in the beginning was a place you went when you were too weak to eat an evening meal. You went to a restaurant not to eat. <laughs> and you might say that people go to restaurants today not to eat because there are many easier, more convenient ways to eat than to go sit in a restaurant. I mean, especially today, you just take something out of the freezer and put it in the microwave. Um, so there's something else going on. What's special about going to restaurants besides the eating? Well, um, this second paragraph helps us to see um, some of what made restaurants so special. Right? That the restaurateur is going to serve restaurants and consommé so that people will consume them without offending their sense of delicacy. So um, you may think that bone broth is a new fad? <laughs> it's not. The fad that goes back to the 1760s. But whereas today people drink their bone broth in mason jars, um, in the 1760s they drank their consomme from, of course, little demitasse cups. Right? It was because it was so condensed, nobody wanted to drink an entire soup bowl of it, of course. And that would not have been delicate. What was important was to have a way of going out that would also signal some kind of delicacy. So what is this weak and delicate chests? What does that mean? Are we really facing you know, a sort of public health crisis of the 1760s? Well, what you need to know is that the definition of weakness of chest in the 18th century could 
could be manifest in many ways. And maybe it's what today we would consider early stage tuberculosis. Maybe it's asthma. Maybe it's a cold. And maybe it's just wanting to show that you are sensitive. Now, to be sensible in the 1760s is a sign not just of physical delicacy, but of emotional, spiritual, moral delicacy. It means that you are attuned to the world. So indeed, you might manifest it by weeping, as an exemplary Greuze girl does at the death of her canary, um, which is a allegory for the loss of her virginity. Um, so it might be that you weep, you faint. Maybe you manifest your sensitivity by being charmed by ruins of antiquity or sunsets and sunrises. But you also manifest yourself, manifest your, your sensitivity by not being able to eat an evening meal. But since sensitivity is a social virtue, it shows how attuned you are to the world around you. What would be the fun of doing that at home by yourself? <laughs> you want the world to see that you are sensitive to it. And so since you're showing the world how sensitive you are to it, you have to go out. But then if you went out and ate a big roast, then you wouldn't be sensitive. So you have to go out to not eat, to show your sensibility. And that's what made restaurants so special. Huh? Now, because they're catering to this particular idea of the sensitive individuals, the first restaurants also had to innovate in the way they served food. So you know, taverns, inns, plenty of other places where you could get food out, put all the food on the table at once, and you sat with people you didn't know. The distinctive thing about restaurant service was that you had, quote unquote, your own table. Um, Rick has reminded me that now some very high-end restaurants tell you that you could have the table, but only for 90 minutes, and then we're kicking you out. So, but you get your own table. You ordered your own meal from, of course, a pre-prepared menu. And you could do it at the time you wanted. It wasn't that dinner will be served at 7 o'clock. Again, today, some very expensive restaurants tell you you know, first seating is at this time, and you have to be here. Um, but that wasn't the, the innovation of the 18th century. So going out to eat was an enjoyable activity because it allowed you to show your sensibility as a social virtue. You had separate tastes, separate tables. It was part of the individualization of eating and of consumption in general. Now, in the most radical moment of the French Revolution, this really came into question. So notice that this idealized picture of the uh, murder of the deputy Michel Le Pelletier, who is assassinated in a restaurant. The higher image, I think, gives us a fairly realistic depiction of the interior of the restaurant where he was killed. Um, but to be seen sitting at a separate little table like that was not what the representatives of the people were supposed to be doing with their Tuesday evenings. Instead, it was expected that the representatives of the people would, of course, be in a room like this, at a big table sharing with other good supporters of the republic. So this whole idea of individualization comes into question during the French Revolution. But in the aftermath of the revolution, this becomes you know, knowing how to behave in a restaurant is a sign not just of sensitivity, but of Frenchness. And this particularly becomes obvious during the 1815 or post-1815 occupation of Paris um, after the defeat of Napoleon. So for my closing slides, I give you these two caricatures of the British or the English at a Paris restaurateur who are indeed committing that cardinal sin of just picking up their pieces of meat um, not having anything sliced. Notice he's got his wine pouring onto the floor. Um, I mean, they're really making a terrible mess of it. And even when they leave the restaurant, they, <laughs> they continue to make a terrible mess of things. Uh, so the take-home lesson is that 
Um, today, as in the 18th century, when you go to a restaurant, you must manifest your sensitivity, you must be alert to the world around you, um, and you must have, of course, a very good meal. Thank you very much. And can you hear me in the back all right? Very good. Um, well, I've, I would like to start out um, not in France, um, but in the United States, um, just to think about the, the question of how people think about the pairing of wine and food um, in the United States. And, um, I have some uh, cartoons uh, from the New Yorker, um, uh, which has a tradition of having cartoons about wine um, that, that going back to James Thurber. Um, and nowadays, they almost always show a sommelier presenting a bottle of wine um, to customers, and that in itself creates an opportunity uh, for humor. Is this the wine that you selected at random? It barely matters, actually, what the caption says, as long as people see that posture. This is a big wine. I recommend you order some big food. <laughs> What's funny is the suggestion of uh, anxiety in the face of the vast choices possible in pairing wine and food. In fact, the humor is the same even without a caption and even without the wine because presenting craft beer as if it were wine um, <laughs> brings back all that unease um, about wine with food. In France, on the other hand, um, wine has historically not been viewed as elitist, and an ordinary World War I soldier might give a salute to the Planck red wine that was known as Pinard. At the beginning of World War I, French soldiers had a ration of one liter a day of that wine. And by the end of the war, the ration was two liters. <laughs> this man doesn't even have his, his whole ration, and it does look like he has better wines. And um, in a, a recent article in a French magazine, uh, Julia Child once said that she hoped in the U.S. there could be a serious discussion about what wines could work at McDonald's. Um, well, here, here it is in France. Um, so pairing wine in, uh, with food in France is a very serious business, uh, but it's not easy to analyze historically. Uh, historians who write about food um, rarely write about wine and vice versa. This has struck me as curious because in France, unlike many other countries, wine is mainly cons consumed with meals. Uh, and I've searched, oh, it's getting ahead, um, I've searched for years for literary examples of people in France embarrassed by making the wrong wine choices. And if anyone knows good examples, please let me know later. Um, even Proust was hesitant about his own wine choices, but he wasn't hesitant about um, his characters were not. His characters were experts. But sometimes French writers do poke fun at French dining rules because of their apparent combination of rigor and capriciousness. And here, in drawings by a French cartoonist, Gottlieb, you have this earnest, appreciative tourist innocently ordering steak with jam. And the waiter is shocked. But showing uh, showing kindness to a very well-meaning but ignorant stranger, the waiter suggests ordering something less far-fetched or crazy, duck à l'orange. And the joke is that the expert waiter is suggesting another dish that actually repeats the same theme of meat with something sweet that the, the waiter wouldn't allow. 
the duck with the sweet orange sauce is within the canon, but the steak with the jam is not. So the next day, in the bottom panel, the, the tourist has learned his lesson, but he shocks the waiter because he orders a powerful burgundy in the afternoon, and the waiter doesn't think of that. It's, he's disturbed the proportionality of the meal um, by ordering something that wasn't a luncheon wine. So the French often call a successful match of food and wine a marriage, and those who do not respect the rules of marriage may risk being regarded as ignorant or unrefined. In the 1950s, the philosopher Roland Barthes wrote a series of, of essays about what he believed to be the, the cultural mythology of France. And one of these essays was called Beefsteak and Frite. Uh, and he described the importance within French culture of, and the French psyche of having rare beef with red wine, probably the most important food wine marriage today. He wrote here, steak, I'll read the ing it in my translation, steak participates in the same sanguinary mythology as wine. Whoever eats it assimilates a taurine strength. Moreover, he says, knowing how to drink is a national technique that serves to qualify the Frenchman to prove his performative power, his control, his sociability. And he says, the absence of wine is shocking, like something exotic. So in his view, the, the marriage bond is so tight that the food and wine should be considered an inseparable entity. Wine is surely not a mere beverage if its absence is shocking. So where did these ideas come from and how old are they? It turns out that the pairing rules are not so primeval as you might think. And even the sanctified marriage of red wine with red meat has a mysterious history. As with other societal rules, the history isn't easy to discern and it's, it's not always written about. Uh, often customs aren't written down because they seem too obvious. Uh, literary works often have vivid descriptions of, of the food, but they often then just say that the wines were exquisite or something like that without telling us um, why or what those, those wines are. Now, you might think that art could reveal some of uh, the history of wine pairing. Uh, there must be some kind of pairing going on here, but there's, there's no food on the table. And um, uh, in this cartoon, Louis the uh, XVI is a bird whose flight's been cut short by his gluttony because he's trying to flee France during the Revolution, but he's apprehended in a tavern, not a restaurant, um, in Varennes, and we see what he's eating, but we don't see what he's drinking. And there's no help here from Picasso. <laughs> no, no help here. No help here. And perhaps here we have a hint that in the late 19th century, red wine was a good accompaniment for rabbit. Now, the national technique of knowing how to drink that was celebrated by Roland Barthes uh, can also be a burden. And here is the, the Cité du Vin in Bordeaux, perhaps now the, uh, the most important wine museum in the world. The, the curator there told me she's sorry for young men today because they're expected to have the sophistication to select the right wine, yet few today learn that skill from their fathers. Uh, and inside the museum is a very clever exhibit. Um, the curator told me she intended it to be lighthearted, but see what you think. The visitors use a touch screen to pair up to 10 dishes with 10 wines, and then they hear commentary in the language they've chosen. There are about 10 languages possible, uh, maybe more. Um, and this pre-recorded sommelier um, doesn't necessarily insist on a single right answer, but he leaves no doubt that the subject doesn't involve, if not good and evil, at least right and wrong. 
And if you were a visitor who had the misfortune to pair the rare beef, the steak, with a sweet sauterne, you'll receive a scolding in whatever language you ask for <laughs> and something like, oh dear, I won't give you the keys to the wine cellar. <laughs> so this intensity about the pairing of food uh, with wine is not, uh, it's not modern. Let's look at this Enlightenment um, philosophical novel, Thérèse Philosophe. The, the books called Philosophes were actually pornography, but a type of pornography. Um, and in this book, there's a discussion of the existence of free will. And the main character, a young woman, refutes the idea of free will based on wine pairing. Um, the book was published in Britain in 1748, smuggled into France to avoid the censors. And um, Therese said, um, am I not free to drink with my dinner either Burgundy or Champagne? But it's only a rhetorical question. Because then she says, only in a far off haze can you imagine you have a choice. Because if a person actually sits down and at the table, a restaurant where you have a choice, and orders oysters, the dish demands champagne. But history's complicated, and when Therese mentions Burgundy and Champagne, does that mean she is talking about the same wines we think about? Napoleon drank Chambertin, uh, now a very rare and incredibly expensive Burgundy, but he drank it watered and iced and found it very refreshing. Uh, and Champagne in 1748 was still, for most people, a still wine, usually light red, but expensive bubbly Champagne had become popular among aristocratic elites like Therese. So what did she mean by Champagne? And how do we know? Um, there are clues in this painting that was done for Louis XV um, by, uh, that's found at the Chateau de Chantilly. Uh, and it shows wine and oysters. So uh, let's zoom in on it for a minute. Uh, some men are intensely studying the glass, transfixed by something. Bubbles, maybe? The bubbles look right for sp the bottles look right for sparkling wine. Sturdy bottles had been developed in England, um, and those were necessary because in the early days of, sh of sparkling champagne, exploding bottles were extremely common, one of the reasons for the great expense of, of, of the wine. So the stoppers look right. These are not ordinary corks, but something tied down to the bottle. Um, Bowls of costly ice um, were characteristic of the, the serving of uh, sparkling champagne. And we can come a little closer to being sure about what she's drinking because of the man with his thumb over the bottle. And then high up in the painting. <laughs> so, um, in the, in the article that uh, some of you have and is outside, um, I, um, I posit that um, French history reveals four different methods of thinking about pairing um, wine with food. And they're all different. And each needs has a different historical context. And I'll just run through them quickly. Um, the first is. Uh, the regional pairing. Regional identity is very important to French gastronomy. Um, at one level, this is obvious. Um, local wines are available locally, so you're going to have pairings that make sense regionally. Um, some of these are well known. Some might seem a bit odd, like the, the uh, very aromatic or smelly Anduillette de Trois, um, paired with Champagne because they are they're found near each other. Uh, but the non-obvious question for me is not about um, what regional pairings were there in regions, but whether the pairings were respected outside the region. 
Um, I've found no evidence that Parisians in the uh, 18th or 19th century um, were trying to match, make these regional matches. And um, Rebecca and I might talk about that, that later. Um, and Therese's pairing of the oysters with champagne is clearly not um, a regional pairing. So where did regional pairings come from? They came with automobile tourism. And uh, on the left is the 1900, uh, the Michelin Company's advertising slogan was, the tire drinks the obstacle. Um, had nothing to do with food, but um, by 1923, um, they had a restaurant guidebook, and in the 30s, they introduced their famous three-star system, which um, helped uh, encourage motoring and gastro-tourism. Um, second in that period, um, Kurnansky and Marcel Rouf uh, wrote a series of booklets on the regional food of France um, in 1921 that guided gastro-tourists um, to these regional uh, combinations. Um, still, however, it's interesting that the covers show either food or wine, but they don't ever show them both. The second kind of pairing is more contemporary, analytical, intrinsic, even alchemical. Um, and we can try to figure out when uh, that started by looking at the subsequent editions of the, the book many of you know about, the La Russe Gastronomique. This is the first edition, published in 1938. Um, it has some suggestions of wine pairings, but no list of rules, no real principles. It wasn't until revisions in 1996 and 2012 that there was something very new. And that was the marriage of dishes and wines. Marrying a wine and a dish is an adventure that's always exhilarating, but often random or unpredictable. The perfect match demands modesty, intuition, and experience to create a third taste that will blend the aromas and flavors and food of wine. Some people would say synergy. Earlier editions contain no notion of this sort of fusion. A few years ago when Alain Sandorans died, a, a rebel chef turned classicist, um, some articles said he had invented wine pairing. That's completely false, of course. He didn't, but he did do something where he would find a particular wine that he could be assured of a, a good supply of, even if it was an old wine. And then he would work very hard to build a dish around that. He was inventing the dish to go with the wine, and that was something that people just didn't do uh, before that time. Since then, other people have invented much more complicated ideas about um, how, to, how to pair food and wine. Um, a, Quebec, a Quebecois chemist, uh, Francois Chartier, teamed up with the chef Ferran Adria to create novel solutions that he said were intrinsic pairings, deliberately with no regard to tradition. And he would allow us rare beef with red wine, but he implored diners not to have boiled or braised beef with red wine because he said the volatile flavor molecules of boiled beef demand a different kind of spouse. They, um, he said, um, it demands moderately acidic white wine free will has died again. Uh, you might hear it said that uh, Bria Savarin, who's mentioned a lot in Rebecca's book, uh, invented wine pairing. Uh, he was a French lawyer. I'd like to think that he invented wine pairing, but he didn't. Um, he does sometimes mention having a particular dish with a particular wine, but he doesn't comment on the, the relationship. He is witty. He is memorable. Uh, here, he says about having a pheasant, um, the richly flavored dish must be washed down with the best wines of Burgundy. I uncovered this truth from a series of observations which took more work 
than a table of logarithms. The third kind of pairing is the sequential pairing. We got close to that in Rebecca's talk. Um, in the 18th century, there was a world of sequential pairing at formal dinners when all the foods would be laid out at a formal banquet, not in a restaurant, um, at once. And you can't really have pairing when you have all these different foods there. But then in the mid to late 19th century, a new pattern of eating emerged um, called Russian service, service à la Russe, uh, what became known in the U.S. as French service. <laughs> and this was really a prerequisite for precise pairings. Um, and so were developments in winemaking in the 19th century uh, because in, in order to pair wine, you have to know what it's going to taste like before you open the bottle. And before that, before certain technological developments, um, you couldn't, there was too much variation. People couldn't really predict that. The fourth pairing is pairing with the person rather than the dish. And here we get back to what Rebecca said about um, restaurants beginning as a sort of health food. Um, because um, historically, wine selection often had nothing at all to do with food. The Romans had their wine after the meal. Um, medical advice in the early 17th century was that red wine is too rough for women, too rough for aristocrats, and, um, but it provided useful nourishment to laborers. Um, and now in my last slide, um, Louis XIV's wines were selected by his physicians who um, entered into a vigorous debate all over France in the medical colleges about whether the, the king um, would, with various ailments, um, should be, continue to drink still wine, light red wine from Champagne, or convert to red Burgundy. And this man, Dr. Fagon, argued for Burgundy. He edged out his rival to become chief physician to the king. The king began to uh, drink aged, comparatively full-bodied Burgundy. Uh, this was a major blow to the Champagne region helped encourage them to find a new product, and it was a major boost to Burgundy. But what wines might complement the, the king's wine was not even discussed. Now, could it be that the, uh, uh, the court copying what the king was doing and word spreading from there so that more and more people drank red Burgundy with meat that was the predominant food of, at banquets, um, could that have started what eventually became the mythology of Roland Bart? I think that that's really a possibility. Thank you very much. back on. Um, well, we have some, we're going to ask some questions to each other. Neither of us saw the other's um, presentation in advance and um, Rebecca particularly didn't want us to see all her slides and I <laughs> now know why because of that last one. <laughs> that was quite a surprise. Um, I, I wondered, um, in your book you talk um, quite a lot about uh, the origin of what we would now call restaurant criticism. Yes. And, um, and I wondered if you could tell us something about how that fits into the, the pattern and, um, that you were talking to us about. Yes. Um, well, an important part of, I think, spreading the idea of restaurants as distinctively French and distinctively Parisian um, it means that 
we're in the 18th, 18th, early 19th century. Lots of people are not necessarily traveling to Paris, but they're going to hear about it. And so making restaurants seem Parisian, you know, the press is a very important way of doing that. So even if you've never been there, you can read a review of a restaurant and think, oh, there are these strange new things. Um, so in the 1803, there's a brief pause in the decades of fighting that are the Napoleonic and Revolutionary Wars. Um, many British travelers go to Paris to see what had happened to France during the Revolution. What they see are restaurants. And at the same time, um, the aristocrat and really, I mean, he's sort of a Jonathan Swift figure. He makes fun of everything. Um, Alexandre Grimaud de la Reynière starts to publish something called the Almanac des Gourmands. Um, it's a tiny little book, so it's easy to carry around. Um, and it told people the best addresses in Paris for um, buying pastry, buying fish, what to eat at certain restaurants. Um, I think it's pretty clear um, that Grimaud was making fun of anybody who would take him seriously on this. Um, but it sold out immediately. And so then he publishes another printing of the first volume, and then he writes a second volume to or the companion piece. Um, and so that, in many ways, becomes the model, because then the British travelers who go to Paris and get a volume of Crimo de la Vanière, they then cite it in their own descriptions of Paris such that it's not clear if they've ever even been to these restaurants, or they're just saying, this is what Trimo says you should do. And then you find that repeated over and over again. So there's a sort of logic of citation that goes into the making of reputations. And that's so crucial, of course, for um, a restaurant's success today. Right? It needs like a good write-up and eater. Um, and then maybe eventually it'll make it into the national press. And then everybody wants to go there. And he published these himself. They, I mean, with a publisher, right. but they weren't part of a, a newspaper or no. anything like that. They were separate books. Yes. Like certain some people's blogs today. Yes. Yeah. Or like um, some of you may have seen um, uh, Michael Gebert wrote a nice little thing about this talk that may have brought some people here, and has this little book that he published and you get on Amazon um, that tells about restaurants in Chicago. And it's a, the modern equivalent yes. of that. Yes, yes, that's right. It's a standalone little volume. And I'm not actually sure when sustained restaurant reviewing in newspapers starts. I think it's often attributed to Craig Claiborne. But I'm not sure about I, that. I think, I think it's older than that. But he was certainly the first, I, I would think, in the English-speaking world, he was the first um, uh, sort of nationally or internationally known restaurant critic. And his successor, Raymond Sokolov, has written very interesting right. things since. Yes. Um, there was a French um, um, writer who used the pen name La Reynière. Yes. Um, um, Robert uh, Robert Courtine, yes, um, who wrote in Le Monde, I think. And, yes, um, um, I don't. Um, and the the Kurnansky roof books that I, I yeah. mentioned, those were little pamphlets. They were not in a no in a um, in a newspaper. Right now, is there actually now that you've asked me that question? Now I'm thinking, is there a comparable tradition? I mean, we know it today. You know, a magazine like Wine Spectator or whatever. Um, how yeah. old is that tradition? Well, the one spectator people may know, I think it started in the 70s, but I'm not sure. Is there an earlier precursor to it? Uh, for freestanding magazines, just about wine. Um, there is a, um, there's a French magazine that started after World War II, huh. Cuisine et Vin de France, that was started by Krunansky, the, right. um, the Frenchman who adopted an Eastern European pen name. Um, so he could seem more exotic in talking about <laughs> French food. <laughs> and uh, that starts to be published after World War II. Is this, again, a sort of tourism encouraging measure? Uh, I think so. It may also have been um, for the uh, re 
help to, to restart the wine industry yes. and wine sales that had, had stopped during the war. Right. Um, I do know, and I just saw a book about this, and I'm unfortunately blanking on the author. I know it was published by Cornell University Press, um, that it's about in that period, in the immediate aftermath of World War II, where the idea that the French know how to drink, and they don't drink to get drunk, starts to be said regularly. Whereas right. clearly the idea of the poilu who needs his two liters to go back into the trench <laughs> gives us a somewhat different picture right. of French drinking habits. Right. That's, that's, that's very true. <laughs> ah, I see a question already. Mm -hmm. in, in, in during World War I, it's because it was safer to drink than to drink water. Yes. Water, water, water was not drinkable in, during the war on, on, the, uh, on the trench. Of course not. Yeah, so. Right. Um, that's an excellent point. Uh -huh. um, and it's often said that uh, that's why people drank wine or some other sort of alcohol as the basic beverage throughout the medieval and early modern period. Um, and that by mixing wine and water, what was called baptiser le vin, right, so you baptize your wine by putting some water in it. Um, that way, the wine was not so alcoholic that you couldn't do whatever you had to do for the rest of the day, because it's what you were drinking for breakfast. And at the same time, the, the, wa the water wasn't going to give you some terrible mm, uh, digestive problem. Um, well, and uh, you're mentioning the baptizing the wine um, raises the question that some people have asked me, is the association that Roland Bach thought so powerful about red wine and red meat, does that somehow come from the Eucharist? And the answer is that's, that's, um, that's probably not. Um, red wine didn't become really red until um, really the 19th century. Um, there in the 17th century, there's literature mentioning a lot more colors of wine than we have. Of course, our white wine is nowhere near white, but people talked about green wine. Sometimes people still say some German wine has a green tint. Um, there was purple wine. Um, some of our red wine is certainly quite purple. Um, so um, the color of wine is not, is not an ancient thing. And in Roman times, there wasn't really a distinction made between red and white wine. Uh, an interesting thing about really old wines, if you get a wine that is um, 80 or 100 years old, um, white wines um, get more and more golden and then darker as they age. Red wines lose their pigment. So if you have a 100-year-old wine, you might not be able to tell whether it's, it was red or, or white originally. Um, you may not also be able to tell whether it really is a hundred year wine or is a, <laughs> as, a, as a counterfeit. It's, it's funny that the, um, the um, cliche um, for telling somebody that they're not actually doing a very good job is to say that they've put old wine in new bottles. But maybe it should be new, new wine in old bottles. Right, right, <laughs> right. Um, yeah. Some of the most um, successful for a time forgeries of wine have been fairly old wine in really old bottles ah. um, to give it a, a patina of, of authenticity. But you had a slide um, that the, the slide that showed the uh, man trying to eat the whole roast. Yes. And I noticed that was um, identified as the Grand Vefour yeah. um, at the Palais Royal where um, uh, where the regent uh, for Louis XV made champagne popular for the first time, but only for the elites. Um, but that restaurant has a very long history and some important incidents. Um, right, so the Palais Royal um, was uh, basically sold off um, and leased out in the 1780s um, because of the very high debt of one branch of the French royal family. So it was still technically royal, um, but much as many uh, 
big aristocratic households, say, in Britain today are open to tourists. The idea that you would lease out the ground floor to shops and cafes and restaurants um, starts to happen in the 1780s. Um, and the space no that is now the V4 was in the revolutionary era, a cafe called the Cafe Anglais, which, as you can imagine by its name, was not considered to be very pro-revolution. Um, and then I believe it becomes the V4 in about 1817. Um, so named after the then owner. Named after the then owner. Um, but it only really becomes a very famous restaurant actually several decades later. So it's an interesting case, again, of how long it takes to build up a reputation in mm -hmm. an era before instant media. Um, but it then became the first three-star restaurant in Paris after the war, yeah. after World War II, when um, an enterprising chef, Raymond Olivet, uh, bought it from whoever had a sort of ruined restaurant yeah. um, and uh, made it into something very special, but not necessarily much like it was in the 19th century, except for the decor Yes, that, that is still the same. And um, there were apartments, I think, in or near the Palais Royal where some uh, famous literary figures lived, Colette yeah. and uh, uh, Jean Coste, uh, Cocteau. Yeah. And they um, would go to the Grand Vefour, and people learned about that. And it was a time to go back to eating. Yeah. Um, and it became a three-star restaurant for quite a few decades. Right, but I mean, the decor, again, is an interesting point. And if you look at um, restaurant guides published in this country in, I was just talking to a colleague about this, restaurant guides published in this country in the 1920s and 1930s for, say, New York or San Francisco, other very cosmopolitan places with many immigrant communities. The guide will, guidebook will say, oh, this is a true Italian restaurant, or this is a true Mexican restaurant, this is a true Chinese restaurant. But the sign of truth is always about the decor and about how the waiter is dressed. And then n almost no mention of the food. Mm -hmm. So it's really all about ambiance. And the food is a second thought at that point. Um, so I had an another question that I thought of when you were talking. How old is the idea that white wine should be served chilled and red wine at room temperature? And does the temperature affect the idea of the pairing? I think it does to some extent. And um, people like to do little experiments with yeah. temperature and color. Um, if there are some black tasting glasses that are made that make it completely impossible to see the color of the wine, even when you look down in it because there's no internal reflection. And um, you can easily be fooled about whether something is a white wine or a red wine in that as long as temperature isn't a clue. Um, but um, temperature charts, well, so we think that um, the um, perfect uh, storage temperature for wine is about 18 degrees Celsius. Why do we think that? It's because that's the temperature of uh, underground cellars in a temperate climate like France. And um, that's a f as you go underground, the uh, temperature is pretty constant. And so that's where wine was stored. So the wine was developed uh, with those storage conditions. It's not that that's the perfect temperature, but it's that that's how we know how to make good wine mm. and know um, how many years to keep it and, and things like that. Um, so temperature charts, I think, um, started in the 1970s mm. with the French magazine Gomio mm -hmm. that would have quite precise temperatures um, and would say, and, and you will have sommelier now tell you um, serve um, a not very good champagne as cold as you can get it, um, mm. serve um, it warmer and warmer depending on how good it is and mm. serve the best, um, the best champagnes probably just straight from the cellar. 
Mm. And a lot of people do that with, with white burgundy. Um, um, so uh, it's yes. temperature is a, a, funny, a funny question. Yes, yes. Um. But before refrigeration, well, that um, picture of the, uh, of the champagne yeah. shows it being the cups being chilled mm -hmm. and the champagne being chilled yeah. with ice, which was an expensive product. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. normally that wouldn't have been done. Right, right, right. That's fascinating. Um, all right, maybe, yes, there are some questions. Pan? Let's, let's get the microphone to you since we are simulcasting. So. The concept of pairing presumably involves a selection by someone. Uh, the patron, the sommelier, the restaurant. So I guess my question is, is that how far back do you go uh, to look at the geographical availability or commercial ability to take wines from one part of France to another that seemed to be implied in one of your slides about how they pair it regionally, not necessarily the way we would do it now. And was that a significant factor? And was there a time when it came to be uh, obvious? I mean, when you look at some mm -hmm. of the regional descriptions of older you know, medieval banquets and they're drinking Rhenish wine because they're in Germany or mm -hmm. they're drinking mead because, um, I don't know, they're in Ireland. But uh, so I guess that's a, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. No, there, there are records about the transport of wine um, and, the, and sales. Um, and uh, there's a, a, a scholar who is or was at, at Johns Hopkins who wrote a comprehensive study of the rivalry between Champagne and Burgundy from the maybe 14th to 17th century when Champagne was all still wine. Um, Dom Perignon, by the way, was a real person, but he, his scientific work was to suppress bubbles because they thought that was a defect. Uh, <laughs> but um, local wine was available in every locale, but in Paris um, there's a long history of, of importing wine from other parts of France. And, um, and that's why there was able to be this debate um, about Louis XIV's wine. Um, there also um, is the question of um, what countries outside of France were influencing the, d the development of French wine, particularly uh, the English with Bordeaux. And the English had a huge impact on um, the development of, of the sparkling champagne um, because they invented the thick glass um, and um, the, the English really liked the bolder Bordeaux of um, the, uh, uh, that started in the early 18th century. And um, they liked them partially because when they were earlier at war with France and weren't getting Bordeaux wine, um, they were drinking port, and um, that got them accustomed to a, a richer, darker wine, I think. We have another question. Oh, okay. Hi. So when did the profession of becoming a sommelier come into being, and was that somehow tied with this concept of pairing of foods, or was it separate and did it exist before then? Well, the, the first um, sommelier were, um, uh, were not necessarily um, um, client-facing people. Um, they were the people who organized the cellar, um, purchased the wine. Uh, they would have, um, for restaurants, I think I asked you once when the first restaurant wine lists were, mm. and they're soon after restaurants started. Yes, right? I mean the the first restaurants, the ones that are catering to the week of chest, um, do specify that they serve only pure and unadulterated wine um, from several locales, um, and by the 1850s. 
1815 period, right? So when Napoleonic Wars are over. At that point, uh, you generally have at the bottom of every restaurant menu. So a restaurant menu is sort of a grand folio sheet, and then or a folio sheet, and then at the bottom um, there will be a list of maybe 20 or 30 wines to choose from. So already at that point, restaurateurs are at least claiming to offer a variety of wines. Um, what I don't know, and I'm sure you do, is the history of wine labels. Well, so wine labels, that's, that's um, caught up in the question of, of wine bottles as well. Um, um, and wine bottles um, came in, in gradually. Um, Thomas Jefferson bought some wines in bottles when he was ambassador to France, but he bought more wines in cask. Right. And then they're served, uh, they'll, they won't keep as long in, in a cask. Um, and the idea of aging wines for a long period of time, uh, the Romans sometimes did that, but um, in modern, the modern times we're talking about, um, that required bottling. Um, and um, the, the sommelier, um, well, menus, it's interesting that um, Gastronomic historians spend a lot of time looking at old menus, particularly of banquets, because those seem to be the most elaborate um, menus. And I haven't found any um, before the 20th century that match a particular wine to a particular mm. course. They mm. often just list the wines at the bottom. Yeah. Um, Lindsay and I were at a, a really interesting um, anthropological exhibit about food um, last weekend at the Peabody Museum at Harvard um, that is focused on a dinner given for the students in 1910 and goes back into the history of every dish that was served and why people were eating particular portions of a cow when a thousand years ago no one did that in New England. But they had the menu for this 1910 banquet and at the bottom, it didn't list the wines, but it did list the two kinds of tobacco that were served at the meal. And tobacco seemed to have mm. been um, a very important yes. and identified part of the meal in New England in 19 <laughs> around the turn of that century. In a meal for young men. Yes. Yes. <laughs> this was a meal for a young man, and there was a photograph of them, and they were definitely all very well-dressed <laughs> young men. Rick, you alluded to the concept of technology and how that affected the timing of when certain wine traditions came into being. I assume mm -hmm. bottling technology was one, an important one. Yeah. So the question for both of you is, did that technology overlap with the idea of and the popularity of uh, restaurants so that the two could have come together through it being the right time for both? That's a good question. Was it, well, so, it's hard for us to know what wine tasted like even 50 years ago, let alone 200. We can get a 50-year-old wine, but it won't taste like what it was when it, it started. And um, we can read descriptions of it, but that's, it's hard to recreate that. Um, it's a little like the questions of authentic performance technique with early music. Um, but I think it's more difficult because um, we do know something more about those instruments. Um, but um, one thing that, that created reliability of wine in the early 18th century was the use of sulfur, um, which is now um, a controversial topic. And some natural wines have no sulfur. Uh, most wines have much less sulfur than they would have had 20 or 30 years ago or even 10, uh, but it was very important for um, being able to assure people with reasonable probability that when they bought a bottle of wine, it wouldn't be spoiled. Um, so that was important. 
Um, and I think if you're going to sell something in a mm. restaurant, uh, that's, that's important. It's certainly important to have consistency um, if a sommelier is going to give you advice. Yes. Because if it's, if it's just the luck of the draw, what the wine's going to be like, some sommeliers can talk about a wine they've never tasted, <laughs> I think, but um, I appreciate it if they tell me that. Um, so um, the, the bottling um, was uh, something, corks, there were a lot of developments in how corks were used and other seals were, uh, were, tr were tried out. Um, and then extraction methods um, uh, improved, uh, particularly in the early 19th century when the Bordeaux Chateau were, uh, were developing. Two or three of them go back before the 19th century, but not many. All right, so this also makes me think that um, a very m a micro technology that's actually quite central to restaurant culture in the 19th century is the naming of dishes. Mm -hmm. So if there's a possibility that you can eat in various places, but you want to eat something familiar, then having a name like Vichyssoise or Poulet Marengo, mm -hmm. you have to be able to recognize it and to be able to guess what it's going to be. Most restaurants today, of course, don't use names. They list ingredients. And so it may say um, carrots, cashews, coconut, lentils. <laughs> and you're like, in what combination am I going to get, you know, a few slices of carrot in with my lentils? Or will there just be a few lentils decorating my carrot? Um, and so <laughs> there isn't that sort of sense of familiarity um, that comes right. with the names because the names um, got discarded increasingly from the 1960s as pretentious, right. old-fashioned. Or, or they would be inverted. Um, Navarin d'Agneau is a, is a lamb stew, but people started having in the Nouvelle Cuisine Navarin d'Omar, uh, a, a <laughs> Navarin of lobster, um, just to, you know, uh, alert, you, alert you this is something new. Um, but there's a, a big return in uh, some of the most popular um, restaurants in Paris right now to, to going back to old 19th century names, many of which were new in the 19th right. century, um, uh, like um, the restaurant La Poule au Pot, um, that uh, was a, it was an old traditional bistro for a long time, but it's been taken over by uh, a young, important uh, chef, uh, uh, Jean-Francois Piège. Um, and uh, all the dishes are dishes that you could have seen in 1920 mm. with names. And, uh, um, and you can see the mayor of Paris eating there right. and Francois Pinot mm -hmm. and, um, and uh, gastro tourists from all over the world. Well, we're going to take just a couple more questions, okay? Because I think after all that talk about food and drinks, we're going to need to restore ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> so the, let's the, see. The, the red wine, by the way, is uh, Chinon, um, which was the wine of, of Francois Rabelais, um, but because uh, he was from Chinon, um, but we don't know really what the wine he drank tasted like, mm. although he has some pretty evocative descriptions of both the wine and its effect on people. Quelque <laughs> <laughs> question? Ah, yeah, okay, monsieur. Oh, oh, oui. Professor, I finished your book last night, and what, what I, I, perhaps I didn't read it well enough, but the, the switch from when restaurants started um, selling bouillon and, and went to solid food. It was probably about 1780. How did that come about? Okay, so the way that happens is very quickly, um, the first restaurateur um, start adding other items to their menu. And at that point, they're generally calling themselves restaurateur traiteur, right? So the traiteur catered entire meals. And what was distinctive is that the restaurateur did individual portions and separate tables, independent meal times. So once you had that structure, then you could perhaps say, ah, I feel rather 
restored by my bouillon, and maybe I could have, oh, a few slices of chicken. And then maybe after you'd had your chicken, maybe a little rice would be okay. Um, so it is a gradual thing, and the very first restaurant menus we see are quite short. Um, but I think the distinctive thing is um, it just makes good sense uh, marketing-wise to be able to cater both to those who are really too weak to eat an evening meal and to those who want to be in the company of people too weak to eat an evening <laughs> meal. It, it's, it's a really interesting transformation, and, and I like that question because of that. The, uh, there are a lot of uh, food traditions that, that come and go and then sometimes come back again, yes. like, uh, like uh, the, the places that uh, serve bone broth now. Yeah. Um, one tradition that um, um, your piece ended on a, a shocking note, <laughs> um, there um, has, has a woman um, who's done research recently about the 19th, early 19th century, particularly um, tradition of a kind of catering of dishes called harlequins yes. in, um, uh, in, in France. And these were the remarketing of leftovers um, <laughs> from one aristocrat's tail, table to a lesser ones. And these were sold by the, the butlers or sommeliers. Um, and the most expensive ones were during periods of monarchy um, were the um, um, the leftovers from the king or the emperor's table. Um, the, the next best would be from the table of Talleyrand or mm. someone like that. Um, and they, these were, um, would go on and, and trickle down, uh, the trickle down economy, you could say. Uh, and it's called Harlequin because the classic figure of Harlequin has a multicolored um, clown's outfit, right? It's not the white of a Pierrot. And so the multicolor is the many little different pieces of the different food items that you would have on your plate. <laughs> <laughs> okay, dernière question. D'accord. Um, is there a, a particular reason that it was wine that became the sort of drink of choice to pair with food and not an alternative like beer or spirits? Um, that's, that's a good question. And um, we were in a restaurant last night that has three parallel tracks, or maybe four. Um, very serious wine um, advice from a sommelier. They make um, their own beer and have beer pairings. A lot of people there are drinking cocktails throughout their whole meal. And then there's a whole menu of non-alcoholic choices that are, uh, are inventive. So we're uh, not in a pure wine world anymore. Um, wine uh, became the drink of the working people or working poor um, as well as um, the rich in, I'd say, the early 17th century. Uh, before that, wine was too expensive um, uh, for a lot of French people and there was more drinking of beer. And that sort of receded to Alsace. Um, uh, but then when brasseries came in as a kind of restaurant in Paris in the maybe late 19th century, those were an Alsatian-style regional kind of food in, in Paris, and beer was the main, was the main drink there. Um, many uh, winemakers would say the answer is that it was inevitable because it's the best pairing. But, um, <laughs> But worldwide, um, it emerged in, in France and Italy and Spain and Germany and not many other parts of the world. So um, I think we don't know, and that's a, it's a very good question. Right, and there are, the example of the brasserie reminds us all that these sorts of things that seem tradition or to be based just in taste are also affected by major geopolitical events. So if there hadn't been the Franco-Prussian War and if Alsace mm -hmm. and much of Lorraine hadn't you know, become part of 
Germany, and then there hadn't been those refugees who went to Paris, mm -hmm. the brasserie might not have been opened. Um, so there are factors at work here that take us far beyond the realm of gastronomy and wine right. to really thinking about population movements and the reasons why those happen, which often have to do with war, famine, pestilence, and other uncheerful things. Well, I'd like to offer a grand merci to both Rebecca and Rick for what I think we all agree was an absolutely fascinating presentation and discussion. Uh, they, if I, dare I say, they've given us much food and wine pairing for thought. <laughs> so. <laughs> So I'd like to invite you all to join us in the salon where we can taste our wine pairing, food and pairing skills and continue the conversation. Thank you all very much for coming. <laughs>